it's being recorded and uh, uh, somebody can listen into my dulcet tones. I won't make any rude jokes. Oh, well, I might, but that'll be towards the end. OK, so the next slide, I'll just work my way through it and talk to you about Howard and all of the rest here. So Howard Pease, David's great grandfather. There are a lot of Peases, as you're going to find out. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> not least Howard has an awful lot of cousins. So he was actually born near Gateshead. Where he was born, I think, is now the crematorium. So that's not really, I'm not, there's nothing to photograph there because I go around with my iPad and I photograph everything. But the Pease family, for the last couple of hundred years, perhaps a bit more before that, all emanated from Darlington. There's uh, all thereabouts. I mean, there's pieces in Gisborough, pieces in Hull, pieces in Darlington. And as we'll see as we work a little bit further back, uh, they go back further elsewhere as well. But um, his mother and father had moved to initially to Gateshead from Darlington uh, with the ascension of setting up a banking business in Newcastle. Other pieces continued in Darlington uh, in banking as well. Right, next slide, please, Pat. Okay, so I'll just talk my way through this. About half the slides have got a nice picture on and the other half have got some words on. That's it, I'm just switching my heater off there. So Howard's father was John William Pease from this great Pease dynasty. And he married Helen Maria Fox. Um, and now, well, as we're going to see in a minute, her father, Alfred Fox, all the Fox family came from Falmouth. Um, I've said at the bottom here, it is quite likely uh, from as best I know, that bringing families together from Darlington and then subsequently Newcastle on the one hand and Falmouth on the other is there's a pretty big distance there, even if they are all Quakers. Although I understand that Friends House in London acted as a sort of with the annual big shindig would act as something of a, a marriage arranging service. Maybe that's not the right way of putting it, but I'm fairly sure that how that will have happened. Mm -hmm. I can't think of any other way. Um, so uh, we brought together the Pease family from the northeast and the Fox family from Cornwall, both very long standing Quaker families. I've gone back a long way on both of them. Um, now, John William Pease and his partners, they set up a bank called Hodgkin Barnet Pease Spence in Newcastle in the 1860s. There's going to be a little bit more on that in a minute. At the same time as John is marrying Helen Maria Fox, his second cousin, Joseph Whitwell Pease, who's a banker, what a surprise, married Helen Maria's sister Mary. And Thomas Hodgkin in Hodgkin Barnet Pease and Spence married sister Lucy Ann. So by this stage, Joseph Whitwell Pease and John William Pease were both second cousins and brothers-in-law, and John William and his partner Thomas Hodgkin were brothers-in-law, and I think that formed a very strong bond. And they were reputedly, those two in particular, out of that foursome, reputed to be extremely good bankers, according to the uh, various things like, like, like the Victoria County history. Right, next please. There you go. So we'll have a quick look at the pieces. Big Quaker family. Um, I've got the uh, history that uh, some of my uh, or David's Pease families have also got copies of. I, I had to go and buy one, but I've seen other my family members with it. Going back to the 1500s, as best we can tell, to um, probably Essex at the time of Henry VII, as you can see. And then William Pease of Fishlake. And Fishlake got famous... Last year, was it the year before, for a whole pile of floods, poor little fish lake. Uh, but there is a record of William Pease of Fish Lake marrying Galicia Cliff in 1565. So quite well founded. Um, how accurate all of that is, well, the further back you go, it's not so easy. But the uh, Pease family history book that I've got, I think it's 1878, so somebody was already well underway with this. You'll see the little diagram in a minute that I've got Joseph I, Joseph II and Joseph III, and Edward I, Edward II and Edward III. Um, Howard is directly descended from Joseph, whose brother Edward is the famous one that was messing about with Robert Stevenson founding the Stockton Darlington Railway. But they were all investing in railway shares. Howard had uh, shares in about six different railway companies uh, in any case. Um, John Beaumont Pease, who would be, um, <clears throat> let me get this right, John William Pease's father, he married a lady called Sarah Fossick, and the Fossicks are quite interesting. They come from North Yorkshire, 
initially around North Allerton and uh, Great Ayton sort of way, um, but they migrated to London in pin plate working and set up their own businesses. I've been to Welbury, well, and Great Ayton. Great Ayton is still the remains of the Quaker school there, but Welbury, you can't see anything of any note, although I believe Leeds Archives got some stuff, but I'll get there sorted in one day. So I, but it's a possibly another brokered marriage, but uh, Fossick's quite an interesting name. There's not a lot of people called that. Right, next. Right, now, I've, I've half inched this. I pinched it and added to it uh, because I did have this. I did a little article where I was comparing to the Whitwell pieces with the other pieces uh, in Quaker um, Connections. And because one bank, the Whitwell Peace Bank went belly up and the, the John William Peace did very well. So I was trying to try to compare the two banks. So I've, I've used my own uh, diagram and added to it. And it's just so you can see there's plenty of Edwards and Josephs here. You can see that John William Pease uh, on the right hand side is well, what's every year is a second cousin, or is it a third? I'd have to work it out of Sir Joseph Whitwell, but the foxes are coming in. And I've put Howard in a nice little highlight. Uh, that, that one you can just have a look at in a bit more time on your own here. The Coates, incidentally, the book I wrote that I transcribed is Elizabeth Coates at the top. There's no more Coateses in the family because there was nine daughters. So that was the end of Coates coming through the family. But uh, I know what happened to all nine daughters now, which is quite interesting. Right, next, please. Now, Howard had rather a lot of cousins. I was told not to talk about them all, so I won't. I could have bored you for endless hours talking about every one of them. These are the cousins on the Pease side. So John Beaumont Pease and Sarah Fossick uh, with all their children. So there's John William there and Helen Maria, and I put Howard in bold there for you. So all of these lot will be cousins of Howard's. Uh, I think there's 11 of them all together. Again, you can have a little look at them later on, but I do know, for example, that Ernest Hubert Pease appears somewhere as somebody's best man at a wedding, and uh, Edwin Lucas Pease uh, appears somewhere else. They're all having all their cousins at all the weddings, as we shall see from some of the photographs, there's a lot of them. This is just a snapshot, just the children of John Beaumont Pease. This isn't all the Whitwell Pease or anything like that, but there's enough here anyway. Next, please. Now, this is the absolutely adorable little Quaker burial ground um, in Darlington. And that's my husband there taking a snapshot. I would think he's related to 90% of the people in there. What's so sad about it is, I mean, they're letting it grow wild. They were mowing a little bit of it, but they're letting it grow wild around the gravestones. Not like those pictures there with little snowdrops and things, but lots and lots of wild flowers. And I noticed there's an awful lot of ivy starting to creep up the stones. And if they don't take that away, all the writing will be lost. So I'm going to have to go down and find the Quakers in Darlington and say, you're going to have to go and pull the ivy off. Otherwise, it'll ruin it, uh, which is a pity, but keep all the rest of the wild flowers. So, uh, yes. It is for David trampling all over his relatives when he goes for a walk there. Uh, but it's such a beautiful little place. And when the snow drops or the crocuses are out, you can have a little picnic there. And people do. It's, it's open to the public. Now, next, please. Right. So Howard's mother, uh, Helen Maria. Howard's had 47 first cousins on his mother's side. Um, her father was Alfred Fox, and he married a lady called Sarah Lloyd who's descended from the Lloyds banking family. Um, if you go back far enough, and it's not related to George Fox, I've said that, so I'll put that up here. Frank, you go back to Francis Fox, who joined the Quakers. He wasn't related to George Fox, but he would have heard him speak because George Fox was in, was. Uh, I don't know whether Francis would have moved from Cornwall to hear him, but I'm fairly certain uh, that he would have heard George Fox speak, but there's no relationship as far as people know. And they come from initially St. Germans, which is a tiny little village with not much there, and Lou. And I've yet to get to the uh, burial ground in Lou because there'll be quite a lot of people in there. I've put you just some little generations there. Francis married Dorothy, I don't know how you pronounce that, Kekowich. Uh, and their son Francis married Tabitha Croker. Uh, there's lots of Crokers coming later on. Then George married Anna, or I'm not sure it's Anna, or Anna de Bell. The de Bells are married in as well. So in the early 1700s, our Fox family moved to Falmouth, where they settled. And I would need to 
fathom out why they were doing that. But as we'll see on the next slide, what they were up to. Next slide, please. So we get to Alfred Fox, who would be uh, um, Howard's uh, grandfather. Yes. Um, he was involved in the steam packet in Falmouth. There was a little exhibition there about the steam packet, packet and some information about Alfred and the others. He was a shipping agent. There's a lot of them. They were involved in ship, ship brokering, copper mining, tin smelting and foundries. Some of them migrated to South Wales. These, this is an extensive family. Alfred married Sarah Lloyd, as I mentioned, with the bank in 1828. She's directly descended from Samuel Lloyd and Rachel Braithwaite. So when Lloyds took over, Hodgkin, Barnet, etc. It wasn't so much a predatory takeover as, I suppose, reuniting the family. Alfred's father and then Alfred were involved in Glen Durgan Gardens. And if you get to Cornwall, round Falmouth, there's two or three of these gardens, south facing in a valley, able to grow tropical plants, not just Glen Durgan. That belongs to the National Trust now. Um, and Sarah Fox, uh, in other words, Alfred's wife attended Howard's wedding. So she was still around then, but I think Alfred had died by then. Next, please. And this is being me, me being naughty. I do have a book with all these pretty pictures in of Glen Durgan. We did go around there, but it was quicker to pinch one from the National Trust. So thank you very much, National Trust. Well, I'm a member of the National Trust, so I'm sure they don't mind, but it's just for your consumption. And if you wanted one to publish, I'll find one of my own too, because uh, we did take some. I guess those spiky trees, maybe bananas, but I'm not sure. You can see that it's a, a valley uh, going south into some inlet into the fall. That won't be the fall, that will be an inlet into the fall. Okay, next please. Right, now this is a bit of a squash, so you might want to look at it in your own time a bit later on. Um, Alfred and Sarah had I think it's 12 children, uh, all but two of whom sprouted a rather a large number of children who then married and giving Howard 47 first cousins. Now, I have to tell all of you, I've got three first cousins. My husband's got about five or six. If you add the 11 P's first cousins to these 47, Howard had 58 first cousins and he kept in touch with a lot of them. They're all appearing at the same dues over and over again, sometimes traveling what must be a lot of miles. You will notice that um, the foxes have married into Fowlers, which was another banking family, um, marrying um, Hodgkin. Well, we've got that, Lucy Ann marrying Hodgkin and so on. So there's an awful lot of relatives of Howard's and they do keep appearing. And we've got some pictures which I shall show you. Okay, then next, please. This is the one you've been sent a copy of. So it's straight off my computer, which allows you to put pictures in. Um, and it's, it, so I, what I did was I told it, I centered it on Robert Weir Fox and Elizabeth Tregellas from Cornwall. And so it's gone backwards and forwards. Uh, but if anybody wants any more of those, if I move it down a generation and put Alfred and Sarah in the middle, I get a page so big you can't see it, it's enormous because of all the children they had, so it's all a bit cumbersome. But you've all got that one, so do have a look at it in your own time. You can see Tabitha Croker up the top uh, right, left-hand side looking at it, married to Francis Fox, that's not the first Francis Fox. Uh, there's a lot of Robert Weir Foxes, there's cousins and all sorts. It's quite confusing finding them alive at the same time and then trying to work out who died when. Right, next please. So back to Howard, he is after all the focus of all of this. <clears throat> he was born in Saltwell Park. There's still a park there with quite a nice old building in the middle of it. But as I said, the, the creme is where he was. Uh, by 1871, his father and mother had had Pandora Hall built in the west of Newcastle. Now it's not the most salubrious area now, but it's a beautiful old building in its own lands. It had a lot more land. And it, one of the other buildings in the land was Benwell Tower. Now, this is a sign of the generosity, I think, of John William, who was a lifelong Quaker. He didn't convert, and neither did Howard, although I can't prove Howard retaining all his Quaker uh, connections all, the, all of his life, but John William was a lifelong Quaker, we know that. And he, when they instituted the new uh, bishopric of Newcastle, because prior to that we'd come under Durham, it was a chap called Wilberforce, um, John William Pease gifted Benwell Towers 
uh, out and the grounds as a residence for the bishop. So it became the bishop's palace. That was marked in a lot of newspapers as a generous act from a Quaker man. And I think that just says it all uh, about how kind uh, Howard's father was. So Pandora Hall is new. It's now derelict. It may or may not become something I don't know. For a while, it was a school um, and, and all sorts of things. And there's a lovely big wood, pan wood panelled room in there with HMF and JWP intertwined in the letters. It's a bit hard to see, so I haven't put a picture of that in, but I could have done. Right, next, please. So Howard would have been educated by a governess. As far as I can tell, at 15, he went to Clifton College in Bristol, where at some point a sporting accident left him very deaf. I'm not sure he was deaf in one ear or both ears. It did affect his career. And I think it was an influence in him not staying in banking all the rest of his life. The standard sort of wrote Balliol, a cousin of his who was one of his contemporaries at Clifton went to Trinity. So they were clearly not minding which one they went to of these two. Uh, Howard graduated in 1886 with a second class on his in classical moderations. I've forgotten what those are, but we can probably work it out. Um, a friend at Balliol was an executor of Howard's will, uh, Charles Henry Dent, was a director of Barclays and they are married into the pieces in one place. Howard loved all sorts of sport, rugby, soccer, golf, tennis, fencing, the whole kit and caboodle. So he was an avid sportsman. Fishing is another one of his loves. Next, please. So he graduates in 1886. Uh, he joins the bank. I don't think Howard does any other jobs. He goes to his father's bank, Hodgkin, Barnett, Pease and Spence as a partner. And there'll be a picture of him coming up there. The bank had been established in 1859. It became a large private bank with about 40 branches all over the place. Uh, one of the biggest private banks in the country. And therefore when Lloyds and Barclays were doing the rounds, snaffling up and eating up all these little banks, it was on uh, the Lloyds agenda. They started with premises right next to the cathedral, which is the Cathedral of St. Nicholas on the south side, and then to premises at the back of the then town hall, which I gather were very small and tiny weeny. And then Thomas Hodgkin was involved in the design of, don't ask me what a Florentine palazzo model is, because I don't know, I'm not an architect, but you'll see a picture of this in, the, in a minute. And they had the uh, bank especially built. And if you know the Blade and Races, Collingwood Street's mentioned in there, so it's, you can see the details there it's got partners rooms accommodation for visitors right next picture please um you can see that here um howard pease is standing he's the second one along his father john william pease is seated just below howard and there's the other partners um i think one of them hodgkin barnett it might have been barnett died and robert gurney hoare they were also from a banking family, uh, came and joined. So he's on there as well. Hodgkin's the same family as the uh, medics that um, Hodgkin's disease, that sort of thing. Um, if you go to the Mabelly Phillips book, which is lovely, it's all about Northeast bankers. There's a similar sort of picture of the same quality uh, of the Whitwell pieces in there as well, as not to mention all the other ones. So it's the history of banks, bankers of banking. It may be subtitled in the North of England as well. I'm not sure. Right, next please. And this mm. is the Florentine Palazzo model. Do you know what you find when you hunt about? Mr. Johnson, who, oh no, it wasn't Mr. Johnson, whoever wrote this, I've put a reference to it, was writing a PhD thesis and co copied this. It was about architecture in Newcastle. And uh, there was this hardening in there. So if you hunt about, this is, it still looks like that now. It eventually became the Allied Irish Bank and now it's up for sale. So land it was flats or something revolting like that, but never mind. That's on Collingwood Street. Um, and as I said, if you know the Bladen races, away we went along Collingwood Street, that's on the road to Bladen. Right. And I won't sing the chorus. Next, please. So, yes, Barnett died in 1869. They are, I don't mean details, of scarlet fever. So Robert Gurney Hoare, son of John Gurney Hoare, senior partner of Barnett Hoare and Co. moved in. So, uh, and then they were amalgamated in 1902. And at that point, Howard seems to stop working as a bank, a banker. Uh, because in his will, he's leaving money to people that worked for him up till 1902. Uh, so Lloyds and Barclays were busy. They took over hundreds of these little banks. This was one of the larger ones. But given that Sarah Lloyd was Howard's grandmother, it's not a surprise it was Lloyd's. Howard's brother, that my 
mother-in-law used to refer to as Uncle Monty, John William Beaumont, mm -hmm. Pete, and the Monty, um, went on to become the chairman of directors of Lloyd's between the wars. You'll see a picture of him coming in a minute. We can assume, <clears throat> and from what my mother-in-law had said, that Howard's deafness and his increasing interest in history, literature, and all sorts of things like that meant he would never really have the same aspiration as Uncle Monty did, but they did remain very close through life. Next, please. So back to Howard again. Uh, in 1886, Howard was at Falladon. It's the home of the Gray family. Um, and uh, the Greys were distant relations as well as family friends. And there he is at Falladon. Now, there's nothing at Falladon. If you go there, there's two or three cottages. And then you drive about three miles through some through a gateway and you come to this quite nice uh, Georgian, I guess, house. It's not huge. It's quite nice. And it's the home of the Gray family. It's the seat of the Gray family. He was distant related. And there was another family friend of the Greys, uh, Marna, Margaret Kinston. And, you know, it's like their eyes met over the lounge or something. I don't know whether they're all sitting drinking tea and eating cake or what, but their eyes met and they were married not long after. Now, her father was a, um, a religious cleric in the Church of England. He later became a... It was actually not Professor of Classics, I've, I'll correct myself, it's Professor of Greek at Durham and later a canon at Durham Cathedral. So it wasn't going to be at all easy for Howard to persuade Marner, who was obviously not um, a friend, uh, to get married in, in his faith. So they married in a Church of England service at Cheltenham, where he was the head at the time. And they were married by Wilberforce. So Wilberforce from Newcastle goes all the way down to Cheltenham. And if you look at the wedding, you find lists of all the relatives and all the presents. And all the dresses, it's lovely. So they went to live at Enfield Lodge, another one of the properties on the Twendera estate. Um, and then in 1892, moved to Arcot Hall, uh, which he rented. Uh, he didn't own it, and he lived there till 1904. Next picture, please. Howard wasn't short of money. That's Arcot Hall. And that's now a very posh golf club. And I can't play golf. I, I mean, if any of you are golfers, well, my son would say golf is a good walk spoiled. Right, carry on before we say anything rude about golf. And there's our Howard doing his fencing in Arcot Hall. These are family pictures. I've been lucky enough to get the albums and so on. So uh, he was, he was, he, he would have played tennis and probably fenced and one or two other things at uh, university level. He was representing his university, at least some of these sports. Next, please. Right. Now, his father died probably quite suddenly. Oh, lowercase p, bad Joan, naughty Joan. Uh, this must have come as a shock to the partners of the bank and certainly to Howard. Uh, so by 1902, they were amalgamated. He gained 6,600 Lloyd shares on the amalgamation and he had a lot of other shares too. He seems to, at that point, to drop out of full-time banking. He was clearly able to afford to live in a reasonable manner and wanted to write more. He really did want to be a writer and indulge all his activities. Right, next, please. Uh, there's a couple of wedding pictures coming up here and you can look at those in your own le uh, leisure time. I'll just zap through them. Uh, both of these two uh, kept in touch, Uncle Monty. That should, oh, sorry, I'm seeing little mistakes here. That should be a... Uh, Why? Yeah, never mind. Well known for keeping in touch with many, if not all of their cousins. You can see all the ways they were doing that. We're coming to Otterburn. Uncle Monty lived at Nether Grange, which is in Allenmouth, or David's mother would have called it Alemouth in Northumberland. And Howard was at Otterburn. Next, please. Now, this is, I will get the archive to send me a proper copy and do a digital scan. This is from uh, the archive in London, Friends Archive. Um, it comes with a little sort of sliver of uh, thin paper with numbers on that you can overlay on the top. And then uh, an extra piece of paper that you can see underneath, which has got them all, well, not all of them, identified. Now, if you look at the very back row, the four men standing up there, there will be Joseph Whitwell Pease in the uh, mid, the second one along, and John William Pease, the two, uh, there we go, uh, two brothers in law. And Howard, I think, is down the bottom, very bottom on the right, but I might be wrong. Right at the bottom on the right, my right. That I think that's Howard, but that because that person's not identified, uh, but it might not be. Um, this I can't remember the date of this, uh, but it's before he'd met Marner. But 
there's all sorts in there. And I know that Charles Pease can probably identify quite a large chunk of those. Right, okay, next. And here's another one. This time I got this uh, from the, uh, it's a private collection in the Northumberland archive. This is taken at a little village, a little house, country house called Rock, which will be the, I think the family home of the Bowson case, but it might be the Hodgkins, I can't remember. And somebody's helpfully written names on the bottom. So on the very front row, the second lady in from the right is Marna Pease. That's Howard's nice, beautiful wife. You remember the eyes met across the room at Falladon. And I think Howard, no, you'd have to go, you know where we go to the bride, back to the bride. I don't think that's Howard. No, I think that, right, the bride and groom, and I think there's a chap just hiding, um, go above the bride there. I think that's Howard, but I'm not sure. He's not named, uh, but uh, Charles might correct me on that. He's, he's seen the picture. Uh, that was a, the, was the archivist at Northumberland sent me that. I thought it was very kind. I've actually got a, one of their original prints of that. So nice picture, but it goes, goes to show they all turn up. Nothing like a good wedding. They're all there. Right, next please. So in 1904, he bought Otterburn Tower. There's the amounts that he paid. Uh, he spent thick end of 40 grand on it, which is a lot of money in 1904. There's yet another picture of Howard. Right, and Otterburn's coming up, I think in just a second. Next one, please. Right, this is the main entrance to Otterburn. It's a hotel at the moment. I used to go take students there on, on short courses. I love that building. Howard clearly had this window put in. The window's halfway up those stairs, but that's the main entrance as you go in. And David's mother remembers the cook putting out tiny little loaves of bread for the children in the mornings, freshly baked when she used to go and stay there as a child. Ah, you can't knock it, it's lovely. Next, please. So last year, amidst six funerals, several of which were family, it was just, I had a, I mean, last year was an annus horribilis for me, um, but this was the one highlight. And we decided to hire the whole hotel, there it is, and have a family reunion. And there we all are. I'm in the middle there with the grandchildren and, and the little dog in the middle. And the four chaps are my husband, David, uh, well, his middle son, Jim, David, then eldest son, Daniel, and then the youngest, uh, John. Um, I'm the mother of John. David was married before, so the other two have a different mother. Um, and I just think that's a lovely picture. That's just standing outside the front door there. And we had glorious weather. I mean, it was it was a one beacon in the, in the whole of the year. So there we all are, reliving our family. And people brought um, sort of history boxes of stuff in for everyone else to look at. It was just amazing. Next, please. There's Howard getting a bit older. He's sitting outside Otterburn here. Um, he loved entertaining visit visitors. He was obsessed with history, mythology, so was his wife. He wrote a lot of novels, a lot of history books, and huge number that I found in the newspapers of short stories syndicated. Some of these were in a sort of Northumbrian dialect, so they wouldn't be much use outside the Northeast. He was a member, active member of the so-called Pen and Palette Club, and he was a fellow of the Society of Antiquarians of, of London, involved in the local antics and the Lytton Phil, as was his father. Next, please. There's Howard, second one along, with his big hat on and his uh, um, binoculars. And the chap on the right-hand side will be Uncle Monty. And they're fishing, because Otterburn had uh, quite a lot of the Reedsdale River there. There's some other bits and pieces. It became High Sheriff of Northumberland. There was a lot of them going around doing really fabulous things. Howard and his sisters were involved in a very large number of local charities, which I just think is lovely. Next, please. Otterburn is in the middle of Northumberland. It is freezing cold in winter, no matter what you do. So he, they would go to London, which would suit seeing some of the relatives, and uh, uh, rent part of a house. And Howard continued with his writing. And we've got letters and commentaries to sort of say that's exactly what he was doing. He traveled a lot abroad with his cousins. Uh, Alfred E. Pease has been written about by his, his uh, Alfred's son, um, Gurney Pease, 
and Gurney's kindly given me the book and it mentions how it in lots of places going to particularly countries like Africa, uh, uh, North Africa, Mid Africa with Alfred and with one of the Greys as well. So they were all together. Now, every summer, this is why I got so interested with all of this, his grandchildren and the sons of his brother. Now, Uncle Monty didn't marry till he was about 50 something and had two sons. So his sons were the same age as Howard's grandchildren, which includes David's mother and her sister and brother. So all five of them would go to Otterburn, spend a lot of time at Otterburn eating those lovely loaves of bread, and then to Nethergrange, which is in Allenmouth, just near the golf course. Next, please. I think we're nearly done. That's a picture taken from one of, uh, I think it's from one of the obituaries of Howard. He died quite young in January 1928. He was in London, well, in January he would be. His funeral was at Otterburn. It was incredibly well attended by Count Grey, unsurprisingly, a lot of relatives and representatives of huge numbers of charities that he'd helped with there as well. He left about a quarter of a million, mostly in trust with a good life income from his wife, Marna, and many legacies also to charities, family, people that had worked for him and so on. So an all round, I have a lot of time for Howard, I really do. I feel I've got to know him a little bit. Next, please, I think we're near the end now. Oh, there you are, very near the end. So thank you to my husband. And also David's poor mum, who's uh, passed away in 2004, because uh, I used to quiz her about all of this as well <laughs> and about her times at Otterburn. So thank you very much, everybody. I don't know how long I've taken, but uh, that's me and Howard. I've also, if anybody ever wants to know or you want to invite me back, I'll come back. I've written something on his wife, Marna. I've written a lot. I could do you one on Marna and also her sister, Nellie. And I'm starting on John William as well, the father. So I love writing these things and I hope you've enjoyed it and you feel you've got to know Howard a little bit. Thank you.